I have the esteemed honor of welcoming our guests from the Federal Little Parties. To our guests from the four parties, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and to share your party's vision and commitments with us. We appreciate your time. From the Liberal Party of Canada, we have Pam Demoff, the Member of Parliament for Oakville, North Burlington, and Ontario, and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Come on up, Pam. From the Conservative Party of Canada, we have Marilyn Gladue, health critic and member of parliament for Sarnia Lambton in Ontario. Marilyn will be with us as soon as she's able to join us. And from the New Democratic Party of Canada, we have the health critic and member of parliament for Vancouver, Kingston. No. Did you hear that no from the floor? We don't have that person. <laughs> we have, I have to, we, maintain my nonpartisanship, Elizabeth. Replacement for Don Davies is Daniel Blake. Welcome, Blakey. come on up. And last but certainly not least, from the Green Party of Canada, we have Thank Elizabeth you. May, leader of the Green Party of Canada, <laughs> member of Parliament for Sandwich Gulf Islands in British Columbia. Ah. Each of you will have five minutes to introduce your party's policies and platform, focusing on three key areas. Pharmacare, federal funding for CHGs, and your party strategy for affordable housing and homelessness. And I believe, Pam, can you have the floor first? Well, thank you. I didn't know I would, can you hear me? I didn't know I had opening remarks, actually. So um, I, I just want to say, uh, as, as all of you probably know, uh, Dr. Hoskins' report was released this morning, and it's something that we're reviewing. but. Um, it, when it comes to pharmacare, it's, it's certainly an issue that we uh, are very committed to. We know that Canadians need a national pharmacare program. It's something that we can't afford not to do. And uh, I, I will be reviewing his report. I, I personally have not had a chance to read it yet. It's quite a, a lengthy report. But uh, certainly the Health Committee did a study on this, and, and uh, we have taken steps in the last budget to to move that forward and I'm and, uh, and really looking forward to the next steps on it. On, um, in terms of, uh, what was the second one? So you know, I wonder if maybe uh, we might be better off if I can direct a couple of questions to each of you in the three areas that we want to talk about today. Maybe sure, that's a good. More straightforward. Uh, Good either way. I think we'll do it that way, all right? Let's, let's do it that way. First thing I wanted to just mention is uh, we are going to get into the pharmacare issue. I know there's lots of interest because lots of your clients are looking for the sort of expanded drug coverage that may be promised if this new program comes to pass. But for any of you who haven't seen the news, uh, Dr. Eric Hoskins and the National Advisory Council recommended a full single-payer universal public pharmacare program this morning. So of course there's still an election to come and lots of things to happen um, if that's going to be a reality. That's part of what we're going to be talking about here. But before we get into some of those details around pharmacare, I wanted to start off with uh, some questions about like the real reason we're all here today, which is to talk about community health centers. So I'm going to ask this to each of you in turn, but bear with me and here's the question. So 48% uh, of community health centers across Canada actually already receive some federal funding from Employment and Social Development Canada, Health Canada, the Public Health Agency, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, and other federal agencies. But this funding is ad hoc, and it still leaves communities scrambling to sort of pull together some stable funding. So what is your party's plan to better coordinate and strengthen federal funding, federal funding for community health centers? Uh, why don't we start with Elizabeth? Okay, great. First of all, I want to say, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a room full of health innovators and community members who are doing great work. In my own riding in Sandwich Gulf Islands, we have uh, Salt Spring Community Health Society, the Pender Island Health Society, the Galliano Island Health Society, plus a lot of great work being done by the Saanich uh, Peninsula Hospital in in recognizing that we're going to get better medical treatment, better patient service, and it will be a better way to retain our doctors when we focus on 
patient-centered team medicine and not the old model of Marcus Welby, MD, running around every night to every house that needs help, because that doesn't happen anymore. And so we are huge supporters of what we think of as the wave of the future, community health centers, being able to provide outpatient health delivery, preferably comprehensive, uh, focusing on preventative care, ultimately less expensive, will reduce wait times. So the way in which, to answer your question, we do that is we need uh, better funding. We need to go back to uh, the Canada Health Accord. We need to strictly enforce the Canada Health Act to prevent any privatization of health care, which is already occurring and which is a threat to the whole system. And we need to make sure that federal provincial transfers are uh, tied to delivery of health care with asking the provinces nicely, but also potentially coercively, uh, to support community health centers. All right. Jenny, you want to go ahead next? Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Don Davies. I just want to start by saying Don uh, was really looking forward to being here, uh, in part because of the announcement by Dr. Hoskins on the, uh, by, by the uh, task force on uh, Pharmacare. He's on the hill with our leader uh, to be able to provide the NDP response there. So I'm really happy to be here uh, because health policy is one of my uh, interests. I'm not the health critic, but I do follow health policy issues really closely. And, and I appreciate all the work that you guys do and I, and I understand that the model of community health centers really is the way of the future, not just because it's multidisciplinary, but also because it addresses the social determinants of health, um, and, it, and it really takes a more holistic approach and asks, you know, how can, we, how can we ensure that we have a healthy population, both because that's good for people's quality of life, and also because in the long term, it's a much more affordable way to deliver health care and avoids people as much as possible entering medical uh, crisis and deal, tries to deal with issues far enough out that they're maintaining healthy lifestyles and not in need of the, of the more critical uh, kinds of health services uh, that we also provide. So in terms of the NDP's position on this, I mean, you know, the NDP is the party of Medicare. We, we, we've always said that um, investing in, in preventative health is the next step of Medicare. Um, you know, Medicare in the way that it's manifested has been good at the really kind of emergent and urgent medical needs, but has not yet arrived where, where we need it to, where the kinds of services that you offer are part and parcel of people's ordinary um, health experience. We support the call for a national secretariat for uh, community health centers, and we also support the idea that, that we should have a strategy. And um, just echoing some of uh, Elizabeth's comments on that, one of the really important things that was given up when the federal conservatives and then this particular liberal government after it abandoned the global health accord approach was the ability to get provinces all at the same table to talk about best practices, to talk about national goals uh, in, in, our, in, in our healthcare system and to get commitments from provinces in terms of how to implement them. So in 2004 when we had the national health accord there were five priority areas. I don't know that I can list them all by memory, but I think it was heart, uh, stroke, cataracts, hips and knees, and there was a fifth one. And, and one of the great things that that did that you can't really accomplish in any other way is that suddenly provinces started tracking information on the delivery of those services and doing it in a way that you, could, that you can make apples to apples comparisons. And then there was funding that, that came with that, and, 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 you know, uh, it, and it's quite right to say that you need to enforce those standards and common goals, but part of that is to have that conversation. If we want to bring provinces to the table in order to talk about a national strategy for community health, for instance, and many of the other things that we do need a national approach to, whether it's home care or palliative care and, and the other things that you know, Parliament has pronounced on but the government hasn't done, the framework to do that in is a national health accord framework. And so that's also part of the NEP's commitment is, is to bring that national dialogue back to get the provinces at that same table and, and to agree on common goals and the funding that comes along with it. Okay, thanks. Pam, what's the Liberal Party's commitment regarding CC CHCs? So, um, first I want to start by acknowledging we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you. I was a little thrown off when you asked for opening statements and I didn't say a thank you. So I do want to thank all of you for not only being here, but for the work that you're doing in our communities to uh, make a difference in Canadians' lives. Um, in terms of the um, community health centers, I think 
Daniel mentioned um, preventative medicine, and I think that's been a focus of, of what our government has been doing, and it's certainly something that we're going to continue to do looking forward when you look at the new food guide, for example, and encouraging people to eat um, healthy foods, and, and I've heard nothing but good things about that uh, food guide since it was introduced. Um, in terms of best practices, uh, a national dementia strategy, which is going to bring together um, all of the stakeholders to develop a national um, dementia strategy. The same thing around um, post-traumatic stress injuries in first responders and public safety officers, where we're developing uh, best practices so that those individuals are, are receiving the best um, services that they can in their communities. Um, we also invested six billion dollars in um, in home care and five billion dollars in mental health through the health accords that were just signed, which were significant investments. And we can always do more. Um, certainly, reaching people in their communities, ensuring that um, they get the best services. I was in in Rwanda in March and visited a. a community health center and they had determined that they were tired of seeing people coming in with with uh, various illnesses and, and what they really needed to do was get to the root of the problem so they started a co-op they um, so that people had enough money to be able to get the food that they need so that they could trade food and and livestock and, and but really getting to the, exactly what you folks are doing is getting to the root cause of why people are coming in to seek medical treatment in the first place. And if we can prevent that, it's, uh, it's cheaper for the healthcare system. So it, so it is a commitment that we've made as a government and it certainly will be going forward as well. So I heard a lot of commitments in there to health more generally, but Daniel, you mentioned about being supportive of the idea of setting up a secretariat, a specific federal secretariat, which is something that the Canadian Association of Community Health Centres has called for. So if I could throw it back to you for a minute, Pam, would the Liberals commit to supporting a secretariat for CHCs? So in terms of our platform, we're still developing it right now, so I can't give you a firm yes or no. It's, it's, it's something that we need to be looking at for sure and making sure that we're, we're putting a focus on that community health aspect, but I can't give you a firm commitment right now because the platform's still in development. Okay. Elizabeth, can I ask the same question to you? What do you think of the idea of a secretariat for CHCs? I think that you're the experts in what we need for community health centers. And as soon as I heard that you felt, I've always been a bit reluctant to set up yet another bureaucracy agency and hope it's going to make the key difference. But if you tell me that's what you want, it's in our platform. <laughs> well, there, well, there you go. We can all go home now. No, honestly, I, I, we, you know, it's important that there be a voice at the table and in the debates that listens to the people who are the most expert in every area. And I know my colleagues feel the same way. And I do like to be as nonpartisan as possible because I think we're going to get better public health in this country. And we're going to get a better public health system that, that doesn't allow it to deteriorate things fall through the cracks when we all pull together on it. So I'm not trying to say that the Green Party is the only one that can do it. But I am so impressed with the work of community health centers. I mentioned the ones in my own writing, but right across the country. If a secretariat is the focal point for what you think is going to turn the crank to get priority, to make sure people pay attention, then that's, that's an easy ask and it should be no, no, no pressure. It should be in all of our platforms. <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, well, let's, uh, let's turn to something else that I suspect everyone will have to address one way or another in their platforms in the fall, and that is pharmacare. So as I mentioned, uh, what this National Advisory Council has called for is a single payer universal public system. But among some of the other recommendations that are in the report is that there be uh, quite low co-pays. So $2 for sort of essential medicines, $5 for all other medicines, and uh, exemptions for the poor, and a family limit of $100 a year. There's also some big numbers involved in the report. What the council estimated was that by the time a full program might be implemented in 2027, that we'd be looking at an incremental cost of $15.3 billion over what we're paying now, even though there would be savings to the system as a whole. This is what I'm talking about, is sort of the, what the government has to take on. So the council is calling for the federal government to pay that entire tab and to let provincial governments join the program as they're ready, but the provincial governments made very clear to the council all the way along that 
basically, hey, Ottawa, unless you pay for this, we're not in. So can each of you tell me what your position would be on whether you're ready to make a financial commitment of having the federal government pay that incremental cost to bring the provinces into a national pharmacare program? And maybe I'll go this way this time and start with Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, I am really happy to tell you that we were the first political party in Canada to call for universal pharmacare. We did so, we will keep doing it. I am very happy to welcome the report from Dr. Hoskins. I was afraid it might be less, but the, he's got the principles right, got the framework right. I don't think he's got the end year right. We will <laughs> keep pushing for it to be brought in sooner. I understand why they feel there were delays related to keeping the provinces on board. But we don't need provincial buy-in. Everybody should remember this. We don't need any provincial buy-in to create a federal agency to do bulk buying purchases along a formulary, formulary to start bringing down prices. Then the provinces buy in and their incremental costs. I'm fine with the federal government paying for that. It's a recommendation from the report. I want to have a closer look at uh, recommendations 49 and 50, but I haven't had time to read the whole report carefully. So I will be doing so, but we, I, I, you know, I just said when I listened to you about the Secretariat, on my way over here, I don't know how many of you know Dr. Steve Morgan at UBC, who was one of the authors of Pharmacare 2020. So I got on the phone and said, Steve, I haven't had time to read the report yet. And he said, yeah, you're right. We could probably do it sooner than 2027, keep pushing them. Uh, so overall, what you're going to hear the Green Party say is yes to the recommendations, Let's move up the timeline, and yes, we're prepared to make that financial commitment, because without it, we continue to be the only country in the world that has universal single-payer health care and leaves out necessary medications and pharmaceuticals. The one thing we add into the party, which I have to find out if it's in Dr. Hoskins' report, is we're very concerned about big pharma having too many drugs on the market that are not properly tested before they're on the market. We're concerned about not mandatory reporting of the, of the side effects from drugs that kill more people than they cure. Uh, I'm a big fan, again mentioning UBC, I'm a big fan of the Therapeutics Initiative at UBC, which takes the same data set, data set as Health Canada, reviews it, and has actually spotted in advance where Health Canada said, okay, we're going to go ahead with Vioxx, and Therapeutics Initiative says, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, so certain drugs on the same data package, therapeutics initiative, I think, is the gold standard. So we'd want to match our formulary with that kind of analysis to make sure that when we're registering a new pharmaceutical drug, we're doing it based on evidence that this is actually going to help more people than get sick or die from taking pharmaceutical drugs as prescribed. So we're matching those two things together in the way we want pharmacare to come in. It'll save this country billions of dollars. The upfront cost to bring it in incrementally, it makes sense for the federal government to take that on to get this, this to be universal and every province and territory on board. Uh, Daniel, well, Daniel, what do you think uh, on this? I, I know a bit about the NDP's position on this, but I mean, are you prepared to pay that, that federal cost that the council is calling for? Yes, I mean, you know, the NDP has been calling for a pharmacare plan for uh, decades, and I think you're quite right that one of the interesting and positive features of the next election is that I think every party is finally going to have to have a position on this. You know, previously, many parties were just kind of dismissive of it as, a, as something that was too expensive, it was never going to happen, it was just some kind of red-eyed uh, socialist idea of the NDP, and I think we're finally getting to the point where we're having a serious conversation about what is a serious and very realistic policy initiative. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, the federal government now is only spending, I think it's like 17 or 19 cents on the dollar for health care. When we first brought it in, it was a 50-50 cost share. So there's a lot of room for the federal government to be making more investment in health care, whether it's having a real strategy for community health centers or a real pharma care plan. This is one way that the government can begin to make up the shortfall in, in uh, federal funding that's been far too much for far too long. So we absolutely are supportive of that. I, I think one thing that's worth saying for the purpose of the discussion, I, and I know people, people know this, but just to emphasize that what came out today is not necessarily the government position. So right. the government mm -hmm. commission task force, but this isn't necessarily what the government is uh, proposing. So we're uh, anxious to hear what the government is going to say about this. We know that the finance minister has made comments um, well, throughout the whole last year that this has been going on, kind of indicating that they're not prepared to go as far as what was recommended today. 
The NEP actually, we, we released our own uh, plan for uh, Pharmacare, which is similar to some of the reports of this recommendation. We certainly think that we can implement this a lot more quickly. We don't think that we need to wait another eight years in order to have a fully functioning uh, national Pharmacare program. We think that the research is, is done, it's there. People have been advocating for this for a long time. Uh, what we need is the political will to get it done and to get it done quickly. And we also think, and in our own uh, proposal, we're talking about less copayment uh, and having no, no copayment as, as the rule. Uh, and then some of the more expensive brand name uh, drugs that, that patients may need or want above and beyond the kind of generic equivalent may have uh, a, a small copay. But so we think we can actually do this in a way that presents less barriers to Canadians getting access to that plan. Once it's in place, we can get that plan in place more quickly. And, and so that will be, that is the, the uh, NEP position. I would encourage anybody who, uh, who's very de detail oriented to uh, track down our plan. It's online. It's about a 12 page document that uh, lists in, in great detail what exactly it is uh, the, the NEP wants to do and how quickly we believe it can be done. Well, as you mentioned, um, you know, this is a, a report that was commissioned by the government and set up by the government. We don't yet know what the government's position is going to be on this. Fortunately, we have Pam. So, uh, what would you, what would you, uh, what would you say the government's position on this? What would you hope to see here? So, I think it's important to recognize that we've taken this very seriously since we got elected in 2015, and that's why the tax force was created because we do want to see a national pharmacare program and we don't think that people should be having to choose between uh, um, putting a meal on the table and, and getting drugs or a woman should choose not to take beta, beta blockers after a heart attack because she can't afford them or if, you know kids are not getting the medications that they need so there's there's absolutely a commitment from the government and and you know for the first time we've the, the pan-canadian pharmaceutical alliance where we've pooled buying power to reduce drug prices. I mean, we've, we've had you know, provincial plans, private plans, where we've pooled all of those together. So there's already been a commitment from this government to see movement on this, and we did um, task Dr. Hoskin and his, his group to come up with recommendations, and so now the minister is reviewing them, and we're, we're taking a look at them. But, you know, in terms of the cost, which was, which was your question, uh, the parliamentary budget officer uh, when the health committee did their report, they they priced this out, and Dr. Hoskin has included pricing in the report. But I guess on the other side of it, you you have to say how much is it costing Canadians not to do something? Yeah. Can we actually afford not to? And I would argue that Absolutely. we cannot. Right. Um, we we have to do something. Canadians are paying far too much for drugs. Um, one of the my my colleagues at Health was saying that. Uh, you know, one of the, the arguments against doing something has been around research and development. And, and yet in Belgium, which is a smaller country, their drug prices are 20% cheaper than ours. Um, they have 13 times more research and development per resident than we do here. So I, I don't think you can argue that drug prices are the reason that, um, that suddenly we wouldn't have research and development here. And, and, and I think we're, we're committed to a universal pharmacare program and, and I'm, I'm really proud of what we've done so far and now we just need to take it to the next step. All right, um, thanks very much, Dal. I know you look like you wanna jump in and add something there. I'm gonna to try to switch the topic just because we do have a limited amount of time and I know that there will be people who uh, out in the audience will want to ask some questions so maybe you can get your point in when somebody asks that way if that's okay. Uh, and the subject I wanna to switch to is one that I think you all in this room know has a huge impact on uh, people's health, and that is housing. So right now in the US, even some health insurance companies there are investing in housing because they recognize that if you don't have a place to live, it's very hard to have good health. So I wonder if each of you could take me through your key commitments on housing and on ending homelessness. And maybe I'll let Daniel start this time. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, one of the kind of main philosophical differences between the NEP and the uh, government on housing, which I think is really important and speaks to what the NEP wants to do on the housing front, is that the NEP wants to see Canada take a human rights-based approach to housing and to actually say that housing is, is a right here in Canada and that people should be able to have the right to housing. We've had that debate uh, in the House. A colleague of mine, Rachel Blaney, had a private member's bill that, that would enshrine a right to housing in uh, Canadian law, and it was defeated. So that's where we're starting from, is that kind of basic 
philosophical approach, and then saying, how do, how, how, how do we get there? So there are people who already have some resources in order to be able to buy a home but want some freedom in order to be able to release those resources. So we've talked about raising the uh, first time home buyer's tax credit. Um, but I think the, the really important takeaway that I, that I would want people to leave with is that in the NEP we understand there's just a dearth of social housing in Canada. And for as many kind of boutique policy announcements as you can have and we're going to adjust this and we're going to adjust that, there's no getting around the fact that we just need to build a lot more social housing units in Canada. We're not going to be able to house people in the way that we have to if we don't take that on. And the federal government at one point did really understand that and had a robust program under the CMHC uh, and, and real funding and a real collaborative relationship with the uh, provinces that was destroyed in the 90s. And, um, and, and what we've seen in this last parliament is a, is a tepid step towards trying to replace some of that. But it's not on the scale that we need and it's not with the urgency that we need. So the main commitment from the NEP is to get serious about getting the federal government back into the business of building social housing and making sure that people can get a roof over their head and that what they have to pay in rent at the end of the month is proportionate to the income that they receive. Um, you know, we had an announcement in Elma Transcona out of uh, the, the, the national housing strategy and I'm always glad to see investment in my riding of course. But it's in a development that's already well underway. And, and the condition for the money was that, um, was that the rent be tied to a percentage of the median household income in the neighborhood. Well, the median household income in the neighborhood from the last census, which is already dated, was about $70,000 a year. So we're talking about up to $1,700 a month in rent as a condition of getting money for so-called affordable housing. That's not good enough. Those aren't the people in need. There's a lot of people that really, that, that are nowhere near being able to afford even $1,000 a month, let alone $1,700 a month. So a strategy that's making that the condition for public funding is simply too weak. We have to do a lot better than that. We believe we can, um, but it takes real uh, political will and we haven't seen it in enough supply in order to get the job done. So I heard a few jabs at the Liberals' housing approach there, so I think, uh, Pam, would you like to respond to those? Sure. Um, Daniel mentioned the national housing strategy. This is, this is the first time that the federal government has, has gotten involved in a meaningful way in a very long time in housing, $55 billion. It's not insignificant, the amount of money that, that we've chosen to put into housing. And the reason is exactly, I actually agree with with uh, a lot of what Daniel's saying, because if someone doesn't have a safe and affordable place to live, they can't really do anything else. I've done a lot of work with Habitat for Humanity in, in Halton, and you know the work that they're doing, and when I talk to them, they talk about what a great benefit that the federal government's investments are making. Um, I would also argue there's other things that we have done that may not come to top of mind. So we've invested um, just recently $478 million into corrections. It was a place where uh, there had been huge cuts under the conservative government. Well, if someone comes out of the correction system and doesn't have, has not been, um, become a contributing member of society, if they haven't been able to get the opportunity to be released to, to find housing, to find work, they're gonna be in that endless cycle of the justice system and they're gonna end up living on the street. And so there's a number of investments beyond just the national housing strategy that we've made because we recognize that lifting people out of poverty, which are things like the Canada Child Benefit have done, um, lifting 300,000 people out of poverty, investing in skills training, the Canada Workers Benefit, it needs to be a multifaceted approach. So coming into a campaign when, when we're, we're releasing a platform, you're certainly gonna see more of that kind of approach where you can't just say that one thing is gonna fix it. And on investments in housing, just to, to Daniel's comments, we're leaving it up to the local, local governments to make the decisions on what's best for their communities. So what works in my riding of Oakville, North Burlington will not be the same type of housing that works in Daniels or works in Elizabeth's or Maryland's, hi Maryland, in, uh, in Sarnia. So, so the money flows through to the municipalities to say, okay, in Oakville, this is what we need. In, 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 uh, in Sarnia, this is what we need. And, but we're providing funding through the provinces so that those local decisions can be made for what's best for the community. I'll use the example of Habitat for Humanity um, who are building a home for, um, that is going to accommodate single autistic men. 
That's not their traditional model, but they're able to access it. They see a need in the community and they're accessing funding to be able to provide that housing, to give those people the support they need to be able to find employment and live a, a, a rich life in the community. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to take a moment just to welcome Marilyn Gladue to the stage. She is the health critic for the Conservative Party. And while I let Marilyn catch her breath, maybe I can let Elizabeth tell us about the Green Party's position on housing with a warning, Marilyn, that uh, we don't have a ton of time left and I'm going to spend it asking you about Pharmacare. Great. That's what I was talking about. That's why I was late. I figured that's why you were late. I, I had the same problem with media interviews. But, um, I know that the question that was put to us was both affordable housing and homelessness. Mm -hmm. So I want to start by kind of making it vision there because there's a real crisis for affordable housing in the market. People who actually are earning money but the, a home of their own is out of reach for a lot of reasons. If you're a young person, a home of your own can be out of reach because you've got crushing student debt. So Green Party wants to abolish tuition and go back and relieve the student debt on people who already have it. We have a lot of things that can be done in the market to make market housing uh, more available, it changes in our tax system. We used to have an income, we used to have a credit for developers who were building purpose-built rental housing. That disappeared in the 1970s. We haven't had a lot of housing stock built for purpose-built rental housing since then. So that's a whole category of additional solutions So I'm not gonna go through. When we look at homelessness, first thing we have to say is, and, and I am proud of the fact that at least we, I hope other parties are gonna join in, but we are also the first party to call for a guaranteed livable income to eliminate poverty in Canada. Because if we eliminate poverty, then you're able to figure out if, it's, you know, if somebody's homeless in a situation where they actually have enough money and there are affordable units available, then you know you can target that help because that's an addiction issue, a mental health issue, there's something else going on. We definitely, I couldn't agree more with Daniel, we need much, much more housing built for, so that we follow that housing first principle. Get someone in a house. Once you've got a roof over your head, then whatever other assistance are needed, whatever, and then of course, if you're also dealing with guaranteed livable income, people can then be gearing up to get a job without knowing it gets clawed back. So in terms of building housing units, I particularly want to mention models like co-ops. I particularly want to mention co-housing. I think we need to rethink our model of housing too, so we are also thinking about more purpose-built intergenerational housing. We don't want people all sort of, you know, all the seniors are over there and all the children over there and everybody who's working is here. Uh, I think we, we need to think about our housing units in terms of re-establishing community because resilience is gonna be very important. We, ha we haven't mentioned the climate crisis. I'm just gonna say, one of, the be one of the things that Canada has as an asset in our great pile of assets, because we're a tremendously fortunate people, but one of them that we tend to uh, forget to even mention is social cohesion. Healthy communities, we need to reduce the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest to keep that advantage going. But when you have a climate disaster, and we will have more of them, you don't want people who are seniors isolated with mm -hmm. no power, mm -hmm and no phone, no landline, and no cells. That's what goes up first in a fire. That's what we lose in a flood. That's what we lose in a windstorm. And the more that people who are fragile or frail or marginalized have access to a community that knows, I've got to go check on so-and-so. So we're going to, the more that our communities, not just our housing needs, but our social needs and our commitment to each other is part of the lens we use when we figure out what are our housing solutions thinking about this holistically. All right, Marilyn, I think I only have time for one question for you, so I am gonna ask for your party's thoughts on the Pharmacare report, and particularly on the recommendation that the federal government be willing to pick up the entire incremental cost in order to bring provinces in. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, that's actually the announcement that I was uh, responding to with the media. There was a lot of interest in the Eric Hoskins report has come out and suggested that we go with a, a national $15 billion pharmacare program. But the reality is that 98% of Canadians have plans. So we need to figure out a solution that will get people access to their medications if they don't have the ability to pay. But I don't think a $15 billion um, uh, price tag which could increase to 52 billion, according to his report, um, on top of a 20 billion dollar deficit, is a good idea. Um, the CD, oh, sorry, the um, 
uh, Canada Conference Board had published data that said 660,000 Canadians don't have access to a plan. And those people are really in Ontario, there's a, a group, and in uh, Newfoundland. And so we need to come with a solution that will address that. And of course, you'll see that in our election platform in the fall. All right, uh, I imagine now that there's some people out here in the crowd who might have some questions for all of our panelists. So if you do uh, have a question, there are mics placed across the room. There's one over there, number one, number two over there, number three, and we still have a number four? We have a number four this time. Mic number four over there, and in fact, there is somebody already at mic number four, so you win and you get to go first. What would you like to know? Awesome. And I'm actually not looking for one of the political answers. I'm actually ask, looking for a yes or a no. Okay. Okay. All right. One word answers only. So we have seen healthcare under attack. And I honestly did not think in 2019 that we would be saying this in the province of Ontario. Mm. And we know that it is going to happen in other provinces. If elected, not just to form government, but also as members of parliament, would you stand up to any provincial political leader that is attacking healthcare, irregardless of political affiliation, for the good of the people that you have been elected to represent, would you stand up and fight back to save the healthcare that you on stage are speaking to? The sad thing about it is that when we look at the people that are most affected by all the attacks that are happening, sadly, they do not look like any of you on stage. So for the people that look like me, for the many Canadians from coast to coast with disabilities, would you stand up and say yes to fighting for healthcare, yes or no? All right, let's go down the line for the, here. For the records, All right. by the way, uh, for so, the records. Yes, yes or no, starting with Marilyn. For sure. So, yes, we're going to need more money in the healthcare system. No, no, We've no. got an yes aging no. population. You yeah. see, this is what we try to I already to said on. yes. But uh, we have an aging population. One in four, uh, sorry, one in six seniors is going to be one in four in about six to ten years. We've got to move to chronic disease, and we've got infrastructure in hospitals that's old and falling apart. So um, obviously, more money has to be infused. And uh, Andrew Shear's been clear: well, we won't cut the health transfers. All right, Elizabeth. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Uh, there's another yes, and Pam. Yes, but I want to add something. Uh, what, what Doug Ford is doing in Ontario right now is, is terrible, and that's what happens when you elect a government without a platform. And quite frankly, we will always stand up for the Canada Health Act, and to say that you won't make any cuts is the same thing that Doug Ford said in Ontario, and look what we're seeing right now with, with education and health care and everything else. It really upsets me, and it actually keeps me awake at night, what's happening in my community. Brian Pallister said the same thing in Manitoba, incidentally, and I've been spending the last two years trying to prevent the closure of the emergency room in Northeast Winnipeg, along with three other emergency rooms in Winnipeg that are, that are, that are closing. We've seen quick care clinics in Manitoba close, which were a model to try and get people who don't have family doctors access to health care sooner through nurse practitioners. We've seen our access centers, which are a model in Manitoba of uh, community health centers, not the only model, but a model. Being, uh, being closed by the government, all, you know, all after a campaign where they said there was going to be no cuts and there was going to be no, no, uh, no frontline health workers were, were going to lose their jobs. So I'm, I have been doing that for the last four years, despite the fact that it's a provincial government making those cuts. And it's why I was talking earlier about a, you know, a real national health accord, not the bilateral deals that were cut including with the province of Saskatchewan. One of the conditions of the federal government cutting a deal with Saskatchewan was that they backed off uh, private MRIs and, and the issue of private MRIs with, with, within Saskatchewan. So it's why we need a national model. I'm prepared to fight those things. I have been fighting those things and I'm part of a party with a very good track record of doing exactly that. Okay, I think Elizabeth wins the brevity award that round. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we have another question over at microphone number four. Hi there. This. Oh, hi. Hold it. Um, this is specifically for the Liberal member, but others can chime in. Just around your, um, I appreciate your comment about the funding towards corrections, but my question is, what would you do um, as your party to tackle the fact that there's so many inequities, including health inequities, that um, result in people ending up in corrections in the first place, marginalized populations who shouldn't be there, way overrepresented. So instead of putting all the money there, what kind of upstream approach can we do to make them not get there in the first place? Yeah. Pam? You're 100% you're right. And indigenous women are the fastest growing prison population. When you go out west, you're looking at 70 to 80% mm -hmm. of our prisons are, are filled with, uh, with indigenous women. And, Quite frankly, most of those women have ended up in prison because of mandatory minimums that were brought in by the Harper government, and we haven't changed them. I think we should. Um, but, but in terms of reducing poverty, we know that most of the people who end up in prison are there because of a life of poverty or addictions or mental health issues. And so they've, through, through um, growing up in, in um, on reserve where there's intergenerational trauma and a history. Of, we, we need to tackle those problems or we will never solve it. It doesn't mean that we don't put money into corrections because there are people there and we need to make sure that they can see, succeed when they get out because most of them are there because, because they're poor. They're, they're turning to selling drugs. I've met women in, in Edmonton Institute for Women who were there because they were selling drugs for their boyfriend, got stuck with a mandatory minimum, and have been sent to a, a federal correction center because of that. And that's not going to help her keep her family, keep, be able to succeed. So that's why we've brought in things like the Canada Child Benefit. That's why we're investing in Indigenous services to, to improve the life. And as I said, we can do more. Um, but we absolutely have to deal with, with health issues, with poverty, all of the social determinants of health to make sure that people don't end up in corrections in the first place. Okay, I see we've got another question over at microphone number two. Hi, good afternoon. Um, really appreciate your perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask a question about homelessness, but I think I'm going to shift my question given what's preceded me. And I'm gonna focus on prevention. At the plenary session this morning, I heard about prevention. This afternoon, at your session, I've heard about prevention. In 1979, I worked with a wonderful woman. That was four years ago. I worked with a wonderful woman, Naomi Ray Grant, who was a psychiatrist, worked out at McMaster, and wrote several papers about prevention and the need to start shifting in terms of service delivery and in terms of dollars. I think I can work on the assumption we do not have enough money to do it all. If we did, we'd be doing it. I think I can work on the assumption that politically, perhaps building on what was said to my left, it's rather challenging to start shifting and saying no to certain things and yes to others. I haven't seen it happen in 40 years. I've been waiting. I'd like to know how you would see it happen, because I'll base it on the assumption again, there isn't enough money to do it all. And you can talk to me about creating efficiencies. Go ahead, I won't believe you. <laughs> you can talk to me about finding innovative and creative new ways to do things. Go ahead, I will not believe you. I wanna know how you make the tough decisions I want to know how you do that in a democracy where you're looking two, three, four years down the road and wondering and trying to get reelected and knowing that your decisions may be so unpopular that you won't. All right, Marilyn, would you like to start? Yeah, I'd like to start with that one. Thank you for the question. Um, certainly, when it comes to health care, I assume it was a prevention of health, you know, prevention uh, with respect to health care. Uh, we know two things. Um, if we could get people physically fit and get them eating well, um, those are huge predeterminants of health for the leading killers of Canadians, cancer, heart and stroke, a number of, of chronic diseases. And so really there um, is a national uh, paper that has been written. Uh, we studied it at a health committee 
how to get people physically fit, we've got to start investing there. And then obesity is uh, becoming a huge issue, especially in children, and so we've got to um, get kids back exercising, get physical education into the schools, start implementing some of the strategies that have been suggested, and, and for those of us that are in these jobs where we don't get moving around quite as much, we've got to um, be disciplined, we've got to make the effort. All right, Elizabeth, do you want to go next? Yeah, I, I, I think the assumption implicit in the question is that it's going to cost a lot to have a, a strategy that stresses prevention. Uh, we could bring in some money taxing sugary drinks. I don't know why we don't. We can't seem to convince people yet, but I know that the uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Diabetes Foundation, we're looking at this and saying, why not say this is an unhealthy product, it's, an, it's empty calories, put a tax on sugary drinks. That brings some more money into the healthcare system to do some of the other things we need to do. It doesn't cost any money to regulate, to ban carcinogens in our society that create, now we have one in two Canadians will face cancer in their lifetime. It's not the whole solution to make sure that we're not applying carcinogenic chemicals to our lawns, but it sure might help. That's a regulation. The only cost might be that we'll probably get sued by one of the countries under the investor state agreements that we signed onto in trade deals. Mm -hmm. Education, prevention, the idea that we can create walking school buses to encourage both physical activity in our children and reduce greenhouse gases. There are a lot of tools of prevention and making prevention a policy focus also doesn't cost anything. I mean, the, the old aphorism, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, is actually true. But in making choices in the healthcare system right now, we need to put more money into our healthcare system. There are always tough choices. But I think Canadians are ready for political leadership that isn't afraid to say incrementalism doesn't work. We have to do what's right. We'll do it as fast as we can with the resources we have and where the tough choices may need to be made. Maybe we don't need to buy another pipeline. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is that there, there are ways to save money by doing things differently. Pharmacare is an ex excellent example. The, the lowball estimates say that we could be saving $4 billion a year over the whole system. Now, of course, that's not the federal government saving that money, but Canadians are already spending that money. There are better ways of doing it, and that's a significant chunk of change that can be invested, whether it's the federal government or, or provincial governments or Canadians themselves uh, having that money at their disposal. But you're quite right that, you know, I mean, Revenue is always part of the debate. We heard it earlier here uh, with uh, respect to pharmacare. There's no reason why Canada has to have the lowest corporate tax rate in the OECD at 15%. In the year 2000, it was at 28%. So, you know, that's why the NEP uh, ran in the last election on raising the corporate tax rate because uh, we think that uh, Canadian corporations are, are not paying their fair share. When we talk in the House, as we often do, I was just uh, on, on my feet, and I'm by far not the only NDPer who's been asking questions about these sweetheart deals that the CRA is signing for KPMG and people who were cheating on their taxes through KPMG by shunting their money out of the country. That's got to end, and we need a government that's willing to take leadership on that to make sure that those taxes that are owed in Canada are paid in Canada and to close tax havens that are causing us to bleed billions of dollars out of the country every year. The money's there. It, we're allowing people to take that money out of the country and out of the system. It's why earlier this year we talked about lowering the capital gains exemption because we know that's another way that the wealthiest people own their wealth. It's not, not all of their wealth is coming through their income. Mm -hmm. And so they, they hold different forms of capital, whether, whether it's shares or whether it's investment properties. And when they sell them, they get a discount on their taxes. That's all money that doesn't go to pay the things we need. So you're absolutely right. This is a revenue question. And it does take political leadership and a bit of boldness in order to be able to talk about that. And it isn't always popular. But what I can tell you is that the NEP is committed to having that conversation. We've, we've been having that conversation in the parliament. We've announced some measures already in terms of how it is we're going to raise revenue to do these things. And the fact of the matter is the richest Canadians pay a lot less than they did in the, in the, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when the federal government was a 50-50 partner in funding health care. We can do that again, not just by adopting the you know, 1950s policies, holus bolus, but there are ways of doing this today that ensure that the people who are making the most money are paying their fair share 
and we're providing the services that Canadians need and deserve. Canada, of all the countries in the world, has enough wealth in order to make sure that people can live well and live with dignity. And it's a series of conscious policy choices by successive governments in Ottawa that have brought us to the point where we have what I would say is a manufactured revenue crisis. It's not because the wealth doesn't exist in Canada. So we need a government that's willing to show leadership on that. Pam, did you want to add something on that? Sure, thank you. I don't know where the lady that asked the question has, has gone. Oh, um, but you used the word efficiencies. And whenever I hear that word used by political parties, that always equates to cuts in services. Um, you'll see a stark contrast with uh, particularly the Conservative Party where you talk about taxpayers versus Canadians, where you talk about spending versus investments. And the best money we ca can spend is on prevention. I've always been an advocate for a healthy, active lifestyle. And I'm really proud of the way that we did the, the uh, consultations and developed the food guide. And if you talk to anyone who works in nutrition, they will say that it, it's a huge step forward in changing the way that Canadians are eating, which in turn will have implications on health. I think we can be doing more on the active living side and, and working with organizations like Participation who, who did get funding in a federal government, but to get in particular our kids up and moving. And I'm really troubled right now. There's a bill that's stuck in the Senate that's being held up by conservative senators about marketing of uh, marketing to kids. And that's something that we've passed, elected representatives in the House, it started in the Senate, and, and it's, they're being lobbied by industry, and it it's, has a very real chance of being killed in the Senate, which is extremely unfortunate, because we, we're, we're failing our kids by not putting in place some of these initiatives like healthy eating, and that marketing to kids bill absolutely needs to change. The other one that we need to take action on, and, and Elizabeth mentioned, is climate change and changing people's behaviors. If you take public transit, you end up being more active. That's just a fact. Even though you're doing a good part of your commute on public transit, you've either walked or ridden to get there. We need to get kids walking and riding. And a lot of that is changing behaviors and putting a price on pollution, getting people out of their cars when they're able to, and using alternate modes of transportation because it actually makes them healthier. So, so you know, you can argue that a price on pollution is a preventative measure because you are getting Canadians more active. Climate change has a direct implication on, on your health. Um, you look at diabetes, and there are studies that show that, that climate change and higher rates of diabetes are linked together. So I don't think we can, we can, uh, we need to stop talking about efficiencies. We need to stop talking about some of the things we've talked about. And we need to start talking about investing in Canadians, making the right decisions, like the marketing to kids. Any of you who can have any influence, contact the Senate because we need to get that bill passed in the next two weeks, and I really am fearful that it's gonna just die in the Senate. All right, I believe we have somebody over at mic number two. Hello. Hi, so um, my question actually got sparked by something you said, Pam, about the women that are in uh, prison. Uh, last night at our annual general membership meeting, I'm with the Alliance for Healthier Communities, we passed a resolution calling on the government to decriminalize um, uh, personal use of drug use, and also to um, call for a clean drug supply. Um, at the, one of the things that was stated at the very end of the uh, discussion last night was a woman who was a, a chaplain at a women's prison, and she said the majority of the women in prison are there because of personal use of drugs, illicit drugs, and have now been criminalized. They've been taken away from their families, and it costs $200,000 per person in jail uh, because of illicit um, use of drugs and being criminalized and having a criminal record as a result. So given that we passed that resolution last night, I would really be interested in knowing each of the party's position on um, both decriminalization of uh, personal use of drugs as well as producing a safe drug supply, which we know is what's killing people every single day. All right, I'm eager to hear the answer to that too. All right. All right, let's just move our way down the panel. We'll start with you, Marilyn. Sure. Uh, so the Conservative Party um, does not support criminalization uh, of drugs. 
Uh, we want to see people um, that are addicted to drugs get the recovery that they need, and there's certainly uh, been no effort by the current government put on getting people into recovery or preventing them from getting on drugs in the first place. Um, there's always a lot of talk about the Portugal model when we talk about decriminalization, but what Portugal had in place before they took that step was um, 170 recovery facilities for 11 million people. And they had uh, truly universal health care that included mental health supports. And they had mandatory education on the harms of drugs um, from school into the general public. And so um, when they say they decriminalize it, what actually happens there, when you get caught with drugs, you go before a tribunal that has a medical expert, a psychological expert, and a legal expert, and they can sanction. Uh, whether you need therapy to get to the root of the trauma that, that is causing the addiction, whether you need to go to recovery, um, whether if you're a healthcare worker and you're caught consistently uh, doing drugs, that they would uh, sanction you that you couldn't work. So there's a lot of things that would have to be put in place to address the issue, but really um, the current government has spent all their time on uh, safe injection sites and proposing that we, we buy free drugs for people to keep them safely addicted. And I don't think that's what Canadians want. Elizabeth? Yeah, I'm really pleased that that resolution passed here last night. Thank you. We, yeah, decriminalization of personal drug use is an important step. And I think we need to re-identify. I, mean, I think a lot of us were shaken by the news that the fentanyl crisis means that it's actually had an impact on Canadian life expectancy. It's a really sobering reality of how many people are dying in our country. And it generally gets reported as overdoses. It's not overdoses, it's poisoning. Fentanyl is poison. And as I, I'm, I am so, I'm always so informed by, by my constituents. But one of my constituents, some of you, if anyone in this field in opioid crisis may know, Leslie McBain, who lost her son to fentanyl poisoning. and she is one of the really brave parents who formed a group called Moms Stop the Harm. And they're calling for us to say that hard drugs, everything, we have to, be, we have to ensure right now that we have a legal drug supply right across the board because otherwise we're not able to create uh, the testing to ensure that those who are addicted are not killing themselves with a dose of something that they think they know what it is. Another one of my constituents lost a family member because the cocaine, uh, that he'd taken cocaine for years, I guess, but it would had fentanyl in it. He was dead before his head hit the table. This is a crisis of a poisoning. And until all the drugs in our supply are legal so they can be tested and verified that they don't contain fentanyl, we are, we are then, through negligence and sins of omission, complicit in these deaths, and we have to change our drug policy. Okay, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, our, our leader, Jagmeet Singh, has been very clear in terms of the NDP position on this, which is to decriminalize personal use and to, and to stop trying to treat drug addiction through the criminal justice system. It's not an approach. I mean, that approach has had its fair shot at working. It's clear that it hasn't worked. It's absolutely clear that it is not working. So it is time to take a different approach. And, uh, and we are, we're, we're fully committed to doing that. I mean, I, I, I take the point. Obviously, no one is saying, let's decriminalize uh, drugs and not have supports for people. Let's not well, make the, the uh, recovery is. available. Let's not have education on the negative effects of drugs. And no one is encouraging drug use. Absolutely no one is doing that. Big and far, those I things see. should not be, well, fair <laughs> enough. So, well, and that's part of the problem with the opioid crisis. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Dawn, who I'm replacing here on the panel today, I mean, has been up in this parliament many times calling on the government to declare a national state of emergency when it comes to the opioid crisis here. We, we need to start treating this with the seriousness that it, that it, that it deserves and the public health issue that it, that, it, that it really truly is. So I mean, so yes, absolutely. It's time, it's time to take an approach to this that's going to work so we can keep Canadians healthy, not just physically, but emotionally and, and, and create healthy communities. And we're not, as long as we're, as long as we're insistent that somehow this is a problem for the, for the criminal justice system, we're not going to get there. And we can't use the fact that we do not have enough recovery centers and we do not have enough educational programs as an excuse to continue to treat it through the criminal justice system. Right. I'm an electrician by trade. 
And there's a kind of infamous legend of the, of, of the foreman with a sign on his door that says, you know, uh, there's never enough time uh, to do the job right the first time, but there's always enough time to redo it three or four more times. And this is the approach that we essentially are taking. Instead of making the investment up front and helping people conquer their addiction and creating healthy communities, because people say that's too expensive, we don't have the money for that, but they're willing to pay it in spades through the criminal justice system. Yeah. So it's a double standard that somehow the spending is acceptable if you're spending on people when they're in prison, but if you're spending it when they're still in the community in order to help relieve addiction and create healthy communities, somehow that's not a meaningful cost or worthwhile expenditure. So we need to dispel that double standard and then we can get doing the real work that you guys are out there doing and we can support you better to do it to, to create healthy Canadians and healthy communities. And I think uh, in part because of timing, we're now going to be giving the oh, last wait, word wait, to wait, Pam. No, that's I what I was about to say. Okay, okay. Oh, let me yeah, just say that, okay. that I'm saying that everybody else, I think, okay. can, can sit down if you were considering lining up at the mics, and instead we're going to give the last word okay, to Pam. Thank you. I first want to say I'm always impressed with, when I'm in a group and I bring up corrections, because I was three years on the Public Safety Committee, that people are really interested in it and, and, and really want to hear about it. And I just want to thank both individuals who've asked a question and framed it in that way, because I think it's so important to think about some of the most marginalized people in our community. And, and Daniel's absolutely right, we, and, and Liz, about treating this as a public health issue and not a criminal issue. Um, safe supply is a huge is issue. It, it's a, it's two, two young high school students in Milton, Ontario died uh, just recently uh, from a fentanyl overdose. And, and Elizabeth's absolutely right, it is poisoning. They, were, they think they were smoking cannabis and the supply was... was uh, and I, I am pleased to see advertising. My colleague, our colleague, Ron McKinnon, introduced a private member's bill, uh, the Good Samaritan Act, where you can, you can call 911 and you can, you can provide assistance for someone and you won't be charged yourself. Um, the government has been very pro proactive in, in making the lock zone available at no charge, at um, approving safe injection sites. I mean, I know that conservatives don't like it, like them, and Doug Ford is shutting them down in Ontario, but quite frankly, as, as, as individuals, we can either have someone dead on your front sidewalk, or we can have them using their drugs in a safe setting. And more people who go into safe injection sites are likely to seek treatment after they've been in there because they're getting information, they're, they're being supported, they're being given support for their addiction because they have a, a health issue, it's not a criminal issue and we need to start treating, stop treating them uh, the same. So education, the government is already doing it. We need to do more, we need to be reaching out to kids. I, I met with Universities Canada recently and I suggested to them doing, during Frosh Week, start doing some education amongst those students around opioids and around uh, naloxone, make it available so that if that students know that they can administer naloxone and they will actually save someone's life and they won't have, they won't kill them by doing it. So I think, I, I think it's, a, it's a mindset of whether these people are criminals or whether they have a, a, an addictions issue and we need to be treating the addiction, not treating them as criminals and sending them to jail. All right, I want to thank all four of you for your time and your thoughtful answers today. And thanks to everybody for joining us and for asking those uh, very smart and excellent questions. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You.